to the Energy Week podcast. Ryan Ray alongside the one and only Dr. Energy herself, Ellen Wald. Ellen, how's it going? Everything is fantastic. Well, other than, you know, the, for oil hedge oh. funds and, uh, you know, stockbrokers, <laughs> stockbrokers, government employees. <laughs> it's, everything in your world is fantastic. Exactly. I have cookie icing. On my iPad, I have just discovered from my cookie baking uh, activities this weekend. So, well, well that's iPad the, had fun. The cookies, yeah, yeah the cookies uh, were probably good. So, I got a, I got a question for you. Do you know what tomorrow is? It is December eighteenth. Okay, one for one. <laughs> do you know why that date is important? Um, I do not, but I have a feeling I probably should. Well, you, is this the date that we started doing our podcast? That is correct. That <gasps> is the date that you came on. Real quick for the listeners who were kind of new, David Blackman and I had started the show, and Ellen and I were talking about doing a separate show. David had to leave for business reasons and whatnot and couldn't do it, and so I called Ellen and said, hey, here's this show's already going. Why don't you come in? And we just pick up where David left off, and I looked it up. I got to think, I was like, was that January or December? And I got to looking at it, and December 18th last year was the day the show was released. Um, so one year anniversary. Congratulations, and it's good to have you around. Yeah, we're still going strong, even better than before. That is so exciting. Yeah, I know. Happy I know. anniversary to us. There we go. There we go. We, we've made it through the uh, the Rondo controversy. and <laughs> <laughs> The great Rondo controversy of 2018. <laughs> okay, a couple quick things here. Um, we said this before, but we'll say it again. This is our last show of the year. So we will, we will be back recording um, and releasing a show around January 8th, the week of the 7th. So 7th, 8th, 9th, we'll be back for that week and be back on normal schedule after then until, um, well, until I have the baby or my wife has a baby, I guess. So, um, so anyways. it's a collective experience it's a, I hear, it, it, you know, um, r- real quick story. So we've had three, this is number four. The first two, my wife got epidural. The third one, she didn't. And so she went in, no pain medicines and, and all that. And so she told me, she talked to some ladies that had done it and kind of got some tips and advice and all this stuff. And she said, okay, what I've been told is I cannot cry. If I cry because of the pain, then you, you kind of lose it. You just kind of, you know, kind of goes downhill from there. So if I start to cry, tell me, keep me from crying. So here we are, and I'm holding my wife's hand, and she's having the baby, and she starts tearing up. And I look at her, and I go, don't cry. You can't cry. Like kind of a stern voice. No, you're not going to cry. And and I, and I realized in that moment, I'm the only man in the room who will, I'm, <laughs> so I, I will never experience this pain. And I am telling a woman who's in immense pain not to cry. And I, I just thought they, they made this, they made us shoot a dart in my neck and put me down right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was doing it on my wife's instructions and she thanked me later. But, um, but anyway, so yeah, it is a collective experience, but you know, it's more of a, it's more of a, the, from the husband's standpoint, just try to mess anything up. And so, uh, anyway, so number four will be here in April. We are excited about that. Okay, Ellen, we got Dr. Dean Foreman coming on here in just a little bit, but before we do that, let's get to some news here. Um, Qatar Petroleum to invest $20 billion, with a B in U.S. in major expansion. We've kind of talked about some of this um, the past couple of weeks. What's going on here? Yeah, this is a really interesting um, article. I think this is uh, the the one from uh, Reuters because they did a, a longer um, interview with uh, Qatar Petroleum, and they apparently really want to um, – they're going to announce um, new foreign partners for new LNG trains, and um, they're making a $20 billion uh, investment push into the U.S. They're looking at gas and oil, conventional and non-conventional, and um, and that's on top of they, they're uh, already the majority owner of the Golden Pass LNG terminal in Texas. Uh, it says Exxon and ConocoPhillips have smaller stakes. What's interesting is I think Golden Pass was originally one of those LNG terminals that was designed as an import terminal. And then suddenly when we started making all of our own natural gas, they had to reconfigure it as uh, an export terminal. And that's when Qatar Petroleum, uh, I think they got involved. They may have been involved before. I'm I'm not uh, entirely uh, sure uh, exactly when they got involved there. But it seems like they uh, are really um, happy with their investment in 
uh, in this area. In fact, they announced in addition to this $20 billion that they're going to be announcing, they also announced that they're partnering with ENI, the Italian oil firm, for three oil fields in Mexico. They're going to have a 35% stake in um, these fields in Mexico. They want to begin production in mid-2019 and apparently plan to ramp up to 900 90, sorry, 90,000 barrels per day by 2021, which is really interesting for Mexico, given all of their kind of problems with getting production up and uh, foreign partners and, and all of that. Uh, I know we talked about it er- earlier in the year uh, with regards to the Mexican election as to whether um, the new president, or at that time he looked like he would be the new president, now he is the new president. He was very against the liberalization of Mexico's uh, oil and gas industry, but it does seem like he is just basically continuing to uh, to uh, liberalize it. So um, big push by Qatar Petroleum. Okay. So one of the questions I have is on this, um, I- I'm curious, when we look at this, we say, okay, they're o- owning a majority owner here. Um, do you... Uh, what? Let me see how to phrase this. Will we expect them to bring in um, nationals from Qatar to work at these plants? How much of that do you see? Or or are they going to be hiring U.S. labor? How do they balance that out when you're dealing with an international company that's kind of tied up with a a state-owned entity and all that um, working in the U.S.? Yeah, I think what normally tends to happen is that they form some sort of subsidiary And that subsidiary does the hiring. So like I know when Saudi Aramco was investing in um, what became Motiva and they did it with others, they kind of set up a new like like Motiva corporation. So they're – they happen to be the majority owner of Motiva now, but they, they weren't. And then that corporation does the hiring. Um, my sense is there are always some from the original company. And in this case, it's it's not a bad idea because Qatar is a leader in, right. you know, Qatar Petroleum is a leader in uh, liquefaction. And um, But I do believe that, that most of the jobs are really, are localized. They're not going to get. You know, I mean, it's not like Qataris are necessarily working on the like pump jacks in uh, in, in Qatar anyway. So right. <laughs> let's, 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 you know, so so my, my sense is that they probably hire. It, it's probably localized. Right. Well, and, and that's why I was asking, because they are it kind of, you know, you don't really think of them sometimes as one of the leaders, but they are. And so they they might have some some expertise to bring to the situation. It's not like a. um you know, just a country with a lot of money is investing is actually a country with money that has some expertise. One of the things we talked about, oh gosh, four or five months ago, was they were talking about doing some investments in the U.S. and there was kind of some some rumbling about having foreign interest here in the United States, and we kind of said, eh, not really anything to be concerned with. But this article does bring up something I haven't seen discussed in a little while. Now, I I, I might have missed it myself, but um, is is that um, the nation of Qatar being a kind of supporter of terrorism, it felt like that was kind of a trend for a while in the news. I haven't really seen much of that lately. Maybe I've missed it, but this article points it out. Is that kind of, where are we at with that? Yeah, exactly. It's like the same deal. I mean, yeah, we all know Qatar supports terrorism, Qatar supports Hamas. Uh, the U.S. pawns off terrorists from Guantanamo Bay on Qatar and basically says, here, take them. And Qatar says, okay, we will. But they also host our uh, our big uh, air base in the Middle East after right. the Saudis kicked us out. So it just seems like, yeah, it's true. And But it, it does expose this incredibly like hypocritical thing where people are like, oh my God, we buy gas, oil from the Saudis and they killed a journalist in Turkey who is actually a Saudi citizen. How How can we ever do business with them ever and yet our company exxon and canoco phillips all do business with qatar petroleum which is the main source of income for the qatari government which is more than happy to let hamas people run around free in in their country so you know everyone should just take a big chill pill and stop being get off their high horses because Everyone's doing bad stuff. <laughs> and, and to your point, even one step further, is the government's allowing them to do these deals, and they could come in and you know put some kind of sanction or you know change some law or whatever. So the government's actually complicit in this as well. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing because back when um, when there was an issue with Rosneft, I think potentially taking control of that Sitgo refinery. Do you remember remember mm-hmm, back mm-hmm. because because uh, they held the like debt for Venezuela or something and everyone was like oh my god we can't let that Russia's our number one enemy. There's actually this group this this 
organization in the government. I don't remember what it's called, but I looked into it at that time. And they can essentially review these kinds of things and decide to bar like business certain business deals for national security reasons. So remember way back when when um, the Hillary Clinton did that uranium deal. Right. Was it like Uranium One? So apparently she like packed that committee with people who were okay with them doing that deal, which ordinarily probably would be blocked for national security reasons. So there are like the the, the question is, is it's it's unclear whether it's a kind of thing where like all the deals go up for review or someone has to object for the committee to actually review it. So um so that is an, an issue. Um, you know to consider like if Qatar somehow becomes a serious threat to national security, the U.S. could potentially using this legal means expropriate their holdings, Qatar Petroleum's holdings, because the the majority owner of Qatar Petroleum is obviously the government of Qatar. So, um, so yeah, that that's always a possibility hanging out there. Right. And anytime you deem yourself worthy to sanction another nation, and, and how they do business, I think that handling something on your own nation's land is probably a small potatoes to get that to get that fixed if you if you wanted to. So I don't yeah. think that's a big deal. But to, to, one more thing on this, and we talked about this on the Texas Long Guest podcast with the Port of Corpus Christi. They were bringing up um, Trafigura's trying to build a port, and they brought up that Trafigura illegally sold oil from the first Gulf War back in the early nineties. You know, and they were convicted in federal, not federal court, uh, international court, 2000, whatever. And they're like, this is why we got to be careful to see who we're doing business with. And I, and I was just like, come on, this is, this, I mean, if, if, if you, if you, if you want to be on your high horse, that's fine. But good grief, if you're on your high horse, then there's all kinds of things, you know, because you could, you could, you could just work that logic out here. Well, hold on, you're getting oil from Exxon, Exxon's in with Qatar, Qatar's doing this. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, oh, yeah, you know, it never ends. <clears throat> No, no, I mean, it never ends. On. So let's just acknowledge we do business with bad people, or our companies do business with bad people. This is the way of the world. Yeah, and, and just personally, as someone who is in favor of free markets, I actually think that is one of the ways you fix that stuff, is by doing <laughs> business and deals and yeah. giving those people um, in Qatar who might not have jobs access to jobs, um, spur their economy on and things like that. So um, obviously it gets a little bit more complicated than that, but, but I generally think that um, – we do. I think we get concerned about it only when we're, for whatever reason, concerned about it. You know. Yeah, and when it becomes a political, when it can be used for political gain, is when we get concerned about it, and that's just strikes me as incredibly hypocritical. You know, either be concerned about, you know, if you're really into like ethical economy or whatever, then be concerned about it all the time with everything. But, uh, but yeah, but it does underscore the fact that when. And I know we've brought this up a lot of times, but when we talk like this, talk about energy independence, I mean, come on, everything is intertwined here. Qatar owns assets in the U.S., in Mexico, in North America. I know they own assets in, in Canada, too. So like when you're talking about energy independence and you're only looking at just oil production, you're really missing the whole picture, uh, you know, our assets are tied up in these foreign countries and that's the way it is. And and in some respects, it, it can make it better. Like I said, Qatar has incredible expertise in LNG and the price of natural gas in the United States is extraordinarily low. And if we could uh, export more of that, that natural gas, it might be very good for the U.S. economy in some respects. Right. Okay, well, last week we hoped that as the show numbers climbed, so would the oil price. That was not the case, according to Reuters. Oil, oil drops as oversupply, economic growth worries way. Oil prices fell about 1% on Monday uh, on fears of oversupply. We'll have, obviously, Dr. Foreman on in just a few minutes to talk about what the API is seeing here. Um, but, Ellen, we were talking offline, and it's kind of it's kind of weird because we were just at um, – you know, seventy something dollars a barrel just the other day it feels like. And now we're we're trying to stay above fifty. <laughs> and um you know, and I was telling you, you offline at least and saying on here that you had kind of predicted that hey, these sanctions have the markets a little bit worried and at the time you said like five dollar barrel increase. Um and, and, and it feels like you were really right and maybe even more mm-hmm. right than you realized at the time. 
Oh my God. Yeah, it does seem like it, huh? And I hate to make forecasts. So maybe, maybe I should make forecasts more often. What, <laughs> what do I know? But yeah, it does seem like that. And, um, you know, it says crude, crude um, futures fell after inventories in Cushing rose by more than a million barrels between December 11th and December 14th. And uh, I mean, that's a huge build. And we're definitely going to talk about that later in the show. But it does seem like OPEC's uh, decision, along with Russia, to cut output by 1.2 million barrels per day was not nearly enough. And and I talked to when, so when I was at the OPEC meeting and we're sitting there in the you know press room just waiting and waiting, and waiting, and all anyone's doing is just sitting around and talking to each other and waiting. And so I kind of pulled some people online. I said, well, what what is the market? Like, what would the market like to see? What would you traders like to see? And they were like, at least 1.4 million barrel per day cut. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking that there's no way that's going to happen. They're not going to get that. I was like, if they get a million, it'll be good. So they got 1.2 million because Russia came in with a slightly higher cut than, um, you know, than I think was expected. But as predicted, market didn't like that. And, right. you know, it's... I just like those people who thought we were going to hit $90 or remember those headlines, triple digit oil is coming. <laughs> Prepare yourself, charge your electric cars. No, sorry. It, it didn't happen. <laughs> and barring something crazy, I think we're both willing to predict no $100 oil for 2018. I'm going on the record saying no $100 oil for 2018. Can I get you on the record for that as well? Oh yeah. I'll, I'll go even <laughs> farther. I don't think we're going to hit I, I mean, I don't think WTI will make it past like fifty-five, Ooh, and, and I, I don't prediction. think we're gonna, you're going all I mean, in. I, yeah, I don't, really don't think we're going to see all that much movement in commodities, uh, particularly oil, between now and the rest of the year. I just think everyone's basically kind of. Uh, right. I mean, okay, there could be, there could always be some sort of like war or explosion that could change things. So, sure. barring what do they call them in like um, contracts? Uh, barring an act of God, right? How about that? Barring an act of God, um, you know, I really don't think we're going to see a whole lot, uh, a whole lot happening um, in in oil, and it's basically wrapping up for the end of the year. Some of the interesting things, though, we're seeing, and, and I, maybe we'll talk about this come January, is when the the hedge funds start to like, like some of them are like closing, or they're like, oh, we really bet wrong in oil and and stuff like that. It's kind of interesting to see uh, to see them taking stock of what happened this year and i i don't know i really i I was really really not buying this 90 dollar oil craze i don't know why they did so let me ask you this one of the things i've kind of theorized on the text one guest podcast and maybe on here some too i don't know if i've read this best or not is that um you know, in, if you just take the Permian per se, um, where you have a lot of producers and you have some midstream companies and you have some refiners, but then you also have some companies who kind of do it all, like maybe an Exxon Mobil to, or ConocoPhillips or something like that. Um, one of the things I've kind of thought, um, if you see kind of a boom bust cycle over the short term, this was back in 2016, kind of kind of continue into you know 2019. Let's say the prices did drop a lot, a lot of those companies would have to get rid of their assets and they'd get picked up by an Exxon Mobil or by a ConocoPhillips or something like that. Um, those companies can actually make money um, at different prices because not only can they drill the oil, they can you know ship the oil, and then they can refine the oil. They're method for making money is a lot different than kind of a wildcatter who's out there just pumping because he's got to pump. Um, do you think the long-term play here in the United States oil and gas market, and I'm, I'm talking long-term because um, you know, we, we don't know what the price is going to do, obviously. So let's just say the long-term, 10, 15 years, is we're going to see more and more of a shift from maybe small independent producers, they will still be out there, obviously, to more majors or you know minor company type, uh, 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 minor uh, oil and gas companies that can do multi-phase of of the extraction to the to the shipping to their finding because that the the, the way their books works is a lot more profitable than you know being dependent on the price of oil for your livelihood. I think that that's that's ongoing, and I I think that it will pick up more, especially if interest rates start to go up, continue to go up. I know there's a lot of talk now like about the Fed kind of slowing down its interest rate, rate hikes. And I, I really do think that some of this is, is tied to interest rates because if interest rates continue to rise, then we're going to see people uh, putting, you know, there, there's not going to be that push to put, to, to put money into 
these companies. I think that the low interest rates really helped them and helped them, you know, get really good rates for borrowing and things like that. And if interest rates, if, if the Fed stops raising interest rates in 2019, I think that that could actually slow the acquisition by these larger companies, which might, which does, like you're saying, make more inefficiencies in the system. So right. these larger companies can be much more efficient. Um, but at the same time, like, I, I don't know, I kind of feel like it's the American thing to do is to have these like small like, wildcat companies out there doing this. And that's, that's the American oil industry. So part of me is like a little bit sad, but I yeah. don't know, maybe it's because I think it's like actually like the 1920s out there. And right. Sure well, yeah, you know, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not wishing any ill on anyone, obviously, but you are right. Um, low in, you know, and sometimes low interest rates, we don't really think about the impact it has because we go out, we buy our home, we go, oh, wow, man, that's a home. We got our home for a 3.25% interest or whatever the interest rate is at the time, and that's great, da, da, da. Um, and, okay, so that allows you to buy a more expensive home than if the interest rates were at 6 or 7%. Well, that's a no-brainer, obviously. Um, but if you take that into the business world, then you can start to see that there's a lot of companies who get into certain business strategies um, or investments or you know producing or drilling wells, whatever, that wouldn't normally be able to – afford it, as you're mentioning, because of the interest rates. And so as those rates rise, it depends on how high they rise, obviously, um, it does tighten that market down. But it kind of also has this cleansing effect, as you're alluding to, whereas you, you, you see people maybe with a better, a stronger financial position who can make money at a different at a, um, at a higher interest rate. Um, but it does kind of take out that that guy who's going for broke out there for you know two percent interest rate, and he just went out there and and made it and good for him. So I, I do think that's a good uh, a good point to consider. And yeah. yeah, I don't know. I know Trump's kind of keep the keep the interest rates down for obvious reasons, but um, we'll see how successful he'll be. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a strong. I think that the people who say that they see a recession coming, I think that's a strong argument to keep interest rates down, but. Like whatever, I'm not the Fed. I'm not making these decisions. Don't ask me. Just it would seem like it might not be such a bad thing to cool it on the interest rates rising because the stock market has just had a massive sell off. At the same time, they were probably overinflated too. Like I said, oil prices were over overinflated because of the Iran sanctions hype. But I don't know. I'm not going to get there. Let's stick to oil. Okay. All right. Last thing before Dr. Foreman joins us. Motiva Preliminary picked up, uh, picked to run Curacao Refinery. We haven't talked about Venezuela in a while. Um, Motiva is, looks like going to step in where Venezuela left off, um, which is good for Curacao because it's a little bit more stable than the Venezuela economy in PDVSA. Yeah. The only problem that could potentially hit Motiva would be like, if the U.S. decided to like expropriate it oh, under yeah. some sort of like we hate Saudi Arabia law, but um, but yeah, I think it's a there's a lot of interesting stuff that's being said about this, and I think we should follow this story into 2019 because um, so it's earlier this year. Motiva, so Motiva, by the way, is wholly owned by Saudi Aramco. It's the largest right. single refinery in the United States. And um, apparently earlier they were weighing expanding their Port Arthur uh, refinery, but they said that they decided not to um, because they were worried about concentrating too much production in a hurricane prone location. Probably they hadn't really been cons too concerned about that until they were hit really badly. I think Hurricane Harvey uh, caused all sorts of flooding, which really, really hit them, uh, hit them hard. I mean, I think they brought I think that like the head of uh, Aramco came out to like tour the damage at a certain point. It was really, really bad for them. So, um, so it seems like now maybe they're going to take over operating the um, Curacao refinery. It's a 335,000 barrel per day refinery. That's, um, you know, that's, that's a lot. Um, and, um, and they're calling them the preferred uh, bidder to run it. And they probably do a great job because, they know what they're doing, and they have money, unlike PDVSA, which has none. Yeah, yeah, money <laughs> is important at some, some point, sometime. You, you might need money. Yeah, to make, make – I mean, it's they've had a, a really hard time of it. And, I mean, Curacao is a great place to go on vacation, but they also rely on this refinery for most of their economy. And, um, and you know – it's. I think it's been very, very difficult for them with the difficulties that PDVSA has had keeping their refinery open. And so if the refinery is not running, then they're not making money either. Um, by the way, if anyone at the Curacao 
refinery would like to bring us out to yeah, check it yeah, out yeah. uh you know we're definitely available to take an all expenses paid mm-hmm. trip to curacao mm-hmm. yep yep be happy to so. be happy to go to there i uh but but not close we'll do the podcast we'll do the podcast from yeah, curacao yeah. This just not close to April tenth uh, ish. Just you know. no, no. This would be a winter. I, I don't want to go in the summer. I'm going to the winter. I, uh, this is like a February. I, I had February a a conference in in China. Uh, reach out to me about doing a in Shanghai about doing a presentation on March twenty eighth, and the babies <laughs> do like April tenth, eleventh, somewhere there, and I'm like. Oh yeah. man, it's it's two days to get there. It's two days to get back. It's a one day conference. Oh, I'm not not so sure I could I can get out to China and back right with that close. I don't know. I'm we me and Haley have talked about it a little bit, but it's like oh man, that's just talk about rolling the yeah. dice there. Yeah, uh, that is that is cutting it close. <laughs> okay, and once again we have on Dr. Dean Foreman, chief economist at the American Petroleum Institute, to go over the monthly report that they release. Every month, obviously, at API.org. We'll link to that in the show notes. This report will be coming out on December 20th. Dr. Foreman, it's good to have you on. How are you doing, sir? Hi, Brian. Hi, Alan. Great. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Okay, let's get into it. Um, we got a lot in this report to cover. Obviously, this will be the last report of 2018. Um, you have a couple things that kind of caught my attention. Let's start off with this, that you that you said in the report that, you, that the United States solidified its position as the number one as the world's number one oil producer and the U.S. natural gas industry, the world's fourth largest oil producer after the U.S., Russia, Saudi Arabia. Kind of walk us through this year and how do we get to this point to where now you guys are saying that we solidified ourselves as the number one oil producer and the fourth largest uh, producer of natural gas. This has been a remarkable turn through 2018, where if you think about it, back in the summer when we were talking about China having stopped buying U.S. petroleum, and for three consecutive months they stopped now, but the rest of the world has picked up the slack and done some. So you know, as the U.S. has continued to grow its oil production, and now the natural gas liquids production that's so important as a byproduct of natural gas, which also has been hitting record highs, we've seen now where the natural gas portion of this, the liquids being produced, are equivalent to the fourth largest producer now globally of oil. So hitting all cylinders from a production standpoint. Now, when we separate this out in terms of what it means for the domestic market, refining throughput, refiners domestically are using as much of it as they can. So you know, as of November, 17.3 million barrels per day, and that's a record for the month of November. On top of that, we're exporting record amounts of crude oil, so some 2.4 million barrels per day. So we're producing record amounts, we're using record amounts, we're exporting record amounts, and on top of that, we've now seen the largest crude inventory accumulation for the month of November on record. So it's it's a boon in terms of the amount that's being produced domestically, and now it's a question of just underscoring how much we need market access and a level playing field to make this go. So uh, this all sounds like absolutely amazing news, uh, particularly for the the U.S. uh, oil industry. And yet a lot of the news that we're hearing is doom and gloom as oil prices are barely, at least uh, in in the U.S. for WTI, barely keeping above uh, above $50 a barrel. What does this, um, you know, perhaps prolonged uh, or if we're looking at now, are we looking at another prolonged period of lower oil prices? And what does this mean for this uh, U.S. oil production um, uh, boom that we've seen? Great questions. And in terms of the price environment, while API can't predict it, here's what we can say about the fundamentals. So as this U.S. production has increased, and we're up until around Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving, most of the concerns were all supply related. So it was all about you know, the waivers being given that alleviated the world's concerns about um, the reimposition of sanctions on Iranian crude oil production, for example. And also, frankly, some easing by reaffirming that relationship with Saudi Arabia, some of the geopolitical concerns around Middle East and in particular Saudi Arabian supply. So Fast forward to Thanksgiving, though, and since then, the things that we've been talking about really since the summer where we've been saying, look, the consensus is expecting the global economy to slow. And then the IMF came out in September and affirmed that the potential for an emerging market crisis. And then it's been one intervention after the next from Argentina, 
uh, to Pakistan and Ghana and San Marino, excuse me, uh, San Marino and possibly now South Africa, plus currency being under extreme pressure in Russia, Brazil, what have you. So emerging market debt, emerging market growth dropping off. Now China coming in with results below expectations as well as Europe for the third quarter, expected to continue into the fourth quarter. So as that that global economy slows, you know, we know on a market exchange rate basis that oil demand globally grows at about half the rate of global economic growth. So that translates directly to the bottom line for what we should see, where the U.S. is continuing to just bull and power into 2019 with the amount of production. So that headroom has to be there for U.S. production growth. It's coming almost regardless because the EIA reported as of October that the drilled but uncompleted wells, this backlog of wells to be completed, is at record highs of more than 8,500. That means effectively that six to seven months of, of U.S. oil production at current pace can continue even if you don't drill another well. So the U.S. production is going to continue to grow. That's going to keep pressure on prices. And then OPEC is going to have to decide how they re-equilibrate the market. And this agreement to cut roughly a million and a half barrels, between, uh, barrels per day between OPEC and uh, Russia is going to determine a lot of the course of 2019. One of the interesting things that everyone was talking about, at least at the OPEC meeting uh, when I was there, was the relationship between this cut agreement and the Iran sanctions, and that the agreement is due to be basically reevaluated in April. It's, it's supposed to last for six months starting in January, but they're going to reevaluate in, in April at um, a regular OPEC meeting. And, and you know, um, there are a lot of reasons why um, OPEC is going to have their meeting, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. One of those is the fact that I think Ramadan is in May and they probably don't want to meet on Ramadan. So, but they're going to be in April. And, but that also happens to coincide with the, um, with when the U.S. is going to be reviewing the uh, exemptions for the Iran sanctions. And so the question really is, you know, how much of this is, is all tied up in that if the U.S. decides to basically renew those, those, um, those uh, exemptions, then are we going to have a massive oil glut on our hands again? Uh, you know, are we going to see see stockpiles piling up all over the world, or is this going to be a situation in which there really isn't anything OPEC and now Russia can do, just like in uh, at the end of 20, 2014? Or uh, you know, is the U.S. going to say that's it? Uh, we're we're cutting off the oil supply from Iran, uh, almost, uh, and and um, and that will b help buoy prices. I mean, uh, what what are the other factors maybe that could go on uh, in this situation coming up in April? Well, the amazing things here are that the uncertainties around these large chunks of supply and potential shifts in them really aren't moving the market right now. And for the first time in a long time, we have an oil market that in terms of futures prices has shifted from its normal state of backwardation into contango where higher expect, uh, prices are expected to be higher in the future instead of you know, relative to current prices. So what happens with Iran, it wouldn't be surprise me if OPEC calls an emergency meeting in the first quarter at some point, depending upon whether their announced cuts that phase in beginning in January actually begin to stabilize prices. Because if it breaks below 50, their, their comfort level from budget standpoint uh, you know, comes into play. So the wait and see approach, they may, and you're right, as far as reevaluating the Iranian sanctions, we'll have to see how stringent and whether they're willing to play hardball with the companies and continue to extend the waivers that exist. Also, interestingly, this last week where Iran has signaled that it's going to increase its production almost regardless of these sanctions. And that means that they're pretty confident that they can find some buyers, especially in Asia, for that crude oil. So these are going to be really interesting times this next quarter or two. Yeah, I'd wonder if, if Iran is really capable at this point of increasing its production all that much, uh, which means that, uh, you know, we can, if we keep a close eye on, you know, where they're storing their oil and uh, and where it's going, or if they're planning on uh, putting it into into their own production, you know, into their own refineries, which are in a fairly sorry state, uh, you know, it's, it's, these are all big questions that, I think will really play a major role in in oil prices going into into 2019. Agreed. And th this economic variable of how much the world will demand, how much growth there will be, there's a lot of uncertainty among the outside predictions looking at 2019. So everybody expects it to slow for the most part from the pace, the tepid pace that we've seen 
um, or torrid pace that we've seen in 2018. But instead of pushing 1.7, 1.8 million barrels per day, if it's half that, you know, the U.S. is poised to grow right into that, which means if Saudi wants to maintain its market share, as, as they have in the past, and if they want to counter net-net what happens with um, – with Iranian sanctions, then the fragility of their deal and, and their agreement with Russia, where they seem to be on pretty solid terms at this point, is really going to determine what happens. Yeah, can I can I push you a little bit more on this demand issue because I think that that's that's really one of the the big issues that I think people are just accepting this blanket statement that demand will be less. But one of the things I've noticed is it's not that demand will be less; the demand growth won't be Correct. quite yeah, as yeah. much. And I think that we need to, we need to clarify, clarify, maybe you could talk a little bit about what, what, what's the range of forecasts that we're even seeing for this? Because I've, ever since you mentioned that jet fuel is a, is a very strong uh, indicator of U.S. economic strength, I've been paying close attention to it in your uh, reports. And it seems like there's record uh, jet fuel demand uh, in November too. So is there really going to be, are we really looking to see slowing, slowing economy? So you can unpack that a little more. No, that's awesome. You're right. Jet fuel as of November has hit yet another monthly record. So that has continued. Now, when we look at um, International Association of Air Travel, we've started to see a slowing in the growth of revenue passenger kilometers year over year compared to the pace that it was earlier this year. So, and this is globally as well as the U.S. where it's been dropping off. And keep in mind that most of the indicators economically that we're focusing on as leading economic indicators of interest to you know, our audience here at home are mainly U.S. indicators as opposed to, to global growth where we're looking at, at you know, these broader sets of emerging market issues. And among the U.S. economic indicators, the leading indicators are still, I mean, they're coming off of cyclical highs, but they're really solid. And we see this in terms of manufacturing activity. We've seen it in terms of consumer sentiment, even as the stock market has gone through a bit of a roller coaster, which you know, normally will start to affect sentiment and ultimately spending. And we've seen it in terms of confidence in borrowing, jobs, uh, job growth, wages. Across the board, the U.S. economy has been relatively insulated from these concerns that we've had globally about the pace of trade and, and what's happening with growth. So it is a tale of of two different courses, if you will, between the inter international side, emerging market side in particular, relative to the U.S., but there, there likely will be, because the majority of the growth tends to be in the emerging markets, there will be an impact on, on demand that goes hand in hand with the amount of growth. And you're absolutely right to highlight this as a growth concept, but it is important to oil markets, and it doesn't take, because of the, you know, the sensitivity where relatively small changes in quantity on a global scale can affect pretty large changes in terms of price. That's exactly what we've seen this last quarter, really this last month, where we've got now the sixth largest monthly decline since 1990 and you know, a 20% drop in prices within a month. Now, it could rebound and we have yet to see, but at the same time, um, you know, it's stabilizing in a range that's actually pretty good for the industry and consumers right now. So I'm going to, I'm going to, push you one more thing about demand, which I, I find really, really interesting. Um, and that's one of the, the things that seemed to really um, kind of keep up demand during the last uh, downturn was these Chinese independent refineries. And most people like to call them teapots, but I don't, I don't really like that term. So I call them Chinese independent <laughs> refineries. And is there any indication as to how they're doing? I know that China put some some new taxes on them that kind of slowed down their, their growth or, or their uh, refineries runs, but is there any indication that if oil prices do, you know, stay lower and uh, that they could kind of come in and maybe compensate for some of that declining demand growth? Thinking about where the growth is coming from, and again, not having really looked at, in particular, the, the distillation capacity or these, um, you know, lighter capacity refiners, if you will, throughout China and developing Asia, uh, as they've stopped buying the light oil from the United States, which requires minimal treatment through distillation to be turned into light products like gasoline, um, you know, they're substituting Iranian and Saudi and other Middle Eastern crudes for that. Now, so long as that supply is there and it's abundant, you know, it, no problem, they're going to continue. But the question is, with that, relative to a cost disadvantage now with U.S. 
crude oil trading at a discount to international crude prices, will they be competitive trying to export those refined products where you've had a lot of refinery growth in the Middle East and Asia? Uh, the U.S. refining complex continues to invest. It's hitting this record throughput. It's had, frankly, a percent of capacity operated that's just been you know, right close to the highest levels ever. It's really good. So the U.S. refining complex is really competitive globally from a cost standpoint, and it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Thank you. Um, so let me hop in here real quick. Um, on page four of the report, Dr. Foreman, you have the EIA global supply demand estimates as of December 2018, which looks like it goes through the end of 2019. Kind of break down what all the EIA is forecasting here. Obviously, this is not the API. Y'all don't forecast, but the EIA is forecasting because I have some things I want to ask off of these estimates. Okay, great, Ryan. So it, it, this actually is a shift from month to month in the EIA's outlook, and this is their short-term energy outlook that they revise every month. What we had noted last month was that they had projected five consecutive quarters of a market surplus along with prices that were moving sideways to down. And what's shifted here is they're still showing a surplus for this quarter and the next couple, but then basically market balance or a slight deficit in the latter half of 2019. And the big change there is that they've started to reflect uh, a reaction by OPEC and Russia where they're, they're cutting back to try to balance the market. But interestingly, in their assessment here, one, prices dip through the first half of the year, and frankly, it takes until the second half of the year before the market rationalizes a bit, keeping in mind that we might even see some pullback in U.S. drilling along the way. But, it, but these drilled but uncompleted wells that I mentioned earlier continue to, to be record highs. And basically are a pent-up source of demand growth. So it is going to be a market that has some, some excess capacity here for a couple of quarters. Okay, so if I'm hearing that right, then here in Texas, we've, we've talked a lot about the lack of infrastructure, the pipelines to transport the product to market, selling at a discount. Um, even some producers have talked about maybe um, rolling back slightly some of the Permian drilling because of this. Um, but those woes are supposed to be alleviated by the second half of 2019 and into uh, almost early 2020, it looks like if I'm reading this report right and hear what you're saying correctly, that when we get to the producers in the U.S. readjusting their budgets and their drilling programs for the second half of 2019, we could be in a spot to where you could be seeing um, the market a lot tighter, not, not maybe not even a surplus, but a little bit of a deficit, um, which really could incentivize drilling in the U.S. in the second half of 19. if I'm understanding uh, what's in this report here. I think that's correct, but directionally, you also have to look at the prices that are going with the EIA's outlook, which were in the right. neighborhood of the low 50s. Right. And in a $50 range, keep in mind that Permian uh, Basin drilling, Bakken Formation drilling, based on the average break evens according to BTU analytics that are sitting in the low 40s, $40 per barrel kind of range, these plays should be economic there. But in the first half of December here, we've seen a slight pullback in drilling already. There is some reaction uh, per Baker Hughes data to the downturn in prices. That's to be expected mm -hmm. because we've come down from you know, prices you know, hitting upwards of $80 per barrel down to now you know, closer to 50 So, it, But it's not a dramatic scaling back in drilling. So if we're continuing to drill and with the productivity gains the industry is making, we need fewer and fewer rigs drilling actively to produce the same or more output because those production and technology gains are continuing to improve both the recoverable resource and the amount of production each month. So remarkably, you know, this will be a dynamic situation. We'll have to see what happens with productivity as we continue to tighten our belts through the first half of 2019 as an industry. If the market is in surplus, how much headway the U.S. is making and how much market share it's taking away from OPEC in, the, in that process. And frankly, as this moves forward, just, um, you know, if a lot of the industry has taken the opportunity when we went through this quarter or two of 60 to $80 oil, many of them locked in production using financial instruments, hedging forward on prices to secure those prices for the next quarter or few. Okay. So we're going to see how it plays out, but it, it'll be interesting. Okay. And then one thing that you brought up a couple times now, and it's in the report, is about the ducks. Um, the ducks are kind of <laughs> – 
<laughs> they're kind of this mythological creature out there that <laughs> that it feels like we never have a good grasp on. And I understand your position is they're there, so you have to document them. Uh, and I'm just curious, generally, has the API? Do y'all have the data on like tracking ducks um, when the prices are high, the prices are low? How yet will percentage of the ducks that get completed within a year or two years? Or do y'all have any of that historic data that y'all have done and said, okay, you know, we can go back and look that. Um, you know, the, you know, after two years of a duck, it's, you know, it's not going to be done. Or do you, do you have any way to kind of look at these ducks and say, you know what, at, at a certain point we have this many ducks, but most of these probably will never be completed. So API produces a quarterly well completion report. The next edition of that will come out in January. But beyond that, what I'm citing here are the EIA's monthly tracking of okay. ducks that goes as, it's a subset, and the data are publicly available on their website if you look at their drilling productivity report on, on EIA.gov. So you can download the spreadsheet, and it provides their estimates of how much was drilled, how, mon- how many were completed, and they're showing that the total of drilled but uncompleted wells has, as of October, exceeded 8,500 nationally, and that we've been completing roughly 1,300 wells per month right now. So mm-hmm. that translates to about six and a half months worth of, of you know, wells to be brought to market. Right. And that's an interesting statistic. It's, it's, so you've got this six months of, of, of uh, wells that could be brought to market, but you don't know if it will or won't be. And so it's always one of these dynamics when I, when I hear the duck talk. I'm always curious, um, you know, the people that are a lot smarter than me, what they think about them, because it seems like it's one of these factors that the industry has to talk about, but, but no one really has a good um, grasp for a lot of reasons on, on you know, what percentage of the ducks will actually come to market. Uh, but, but six and a half months, um, and that's at... Um, when you're talking about that, that's at a that's at a that's at these record high numbers, correct? I mean, you're talking about record high levels, or, or what were record high levels of production that are just sitting there ready to come online. That's exactly right. And if you think about the efficacy with which that happens, the midstream optimization and the efficiency of, say, building up your gathering system to you know go from wellhead into other pipelines, but then take it whether it's for processing or right to market for refineries if it's oil, that that gathering can be optimized in a way if you've just got the well sitting there and you know it. Um, it, it provides an opportunity, actually, for bringing more simultaneously as a result of coordinating what you're doing between the upstream or drilling and development part as opposed to the midstream and transportation end. Okay, well, Dr. Foreman, um, once again, this has been very informational and very helpful, and we love this report that you guys put out, api.org. You go to the website. It has a spot where you can find Dr. Foreman's work. This report, we'll link to it in the show notes. Um, they come out every month. They have quarterly reports, and as you mentioned, there's uh, even more reports that we don't get to discuss in this show. Is there anything that we didn't talk about in the report that you'd like to put it, point out to the listeners before we let you go today? Simultaneously on Thursday, we'll also release the latest edition of our quarterly industry outlook, which we we haven't yet put out publicly, but it'll have the story on the economy and, and natural gas markets to complement this oil market outlook. Okay, great. Dr. Foreman, it's a pleasure. We, I guess we won't have you on again until, um, well, I guess January. You'll have a report coming out in January, correct? It is, and it's a week later than normal come January okay. in the way we do it. But okay. we'll look forward to This has been great. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Have a great holiday. You too. Take care. Well, thanks again to Dr. Foreman for coming on right before the holiday. Really appreciate that. Ellen, a lot of good stuff as always on this report. And um, any big takeaways from you? Yeah, I think for me the big takeaway was just – how much they expect this oil boom to continue based on these these ducks. But I did think you raised a really good point, which is that, you know, you, you can't assume that all of the ducks are going to be completed. Um, you know, they, they, we, they've been saying this for a while and they're still hanging out there. Mm-hmm. So uh, to me, that really uh, that that's really a significant uh, a significant issue going forward. Yeah, and, and to his point, he's right that if you look at the supply-demand issue that EIA is forecasting, the prices are low, and obviously this is the EIA, not the API making these forecasts. And I was just thinking as we're talking through that, they're, you know, the, AP, the EIA is just guessing on what they think the price might be. There's no telling what the traders will do or you know what Trump's saying that might influence the prices or whatever. So it's it's kind of hard to see, but it would be interesting if the EIA storage predictions are right. As you get close to the second half of next year, these Texas producers – you know, may consider really ramping up because they would have the spare capacity. The prices might be nice, so it'd be it's something to watch for sure. Um, anyways, 
So yeah. anyways, so Ellen, where will you be, if anywhere, before Christmas? Let's see. I will be on investing.com. I think this week, by popular demand, I'm going to be talking about the demand question, which hey, um, there you go. <laughs> we, we, exactly. So I'm going to be, I think, doing a, a piece there about uh, demand. I'll be on Forbes some more. Not, not quite sure what's, what's happening there, but uh, hopefully something, something interesting. And uh, that, that's really all. No, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. We always say demand is demand growth, not not because right. it's not like the demand's just going away overnight. It's the demand growth. Um, one thing I and maybe we can ask him next time is I would like to know the and I'm sure there's probably no way to really you know break this down, but you know. One thing I thought about before is if you think about the microphones, being you using a microphone at our house, at our house or at our office or wherever right now, recording this podcast. You know, twenty years ago, this would not even be the thing. But these petrochemicals form these plastics and stuff. So I'm curious how the industry is tracking new forms of of, th- of plastics of uh, materials that are being made that weren't even. Um, you know, weren't being sold to the masses, you know, just 10 to 15 years ago. And how we consider that when we look at demand growth, um, it, it, maybe it's not even enough to consider, but there's, if you start adding all those things up, you'd figure at some point it would be, um, at least a little bit to infect, uh, impact the price. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm overthinking that there. I don't know, but it does seem like it, it's a, um, it's a, a very important issue, and as we speak, WTI crude has settled at below fifty dollars a barrel for the first time since October of twenty seventeen. Well, so. way to send the listeners off on a great note. Exactly. <laughs> okay, Ellen. Well, I hope you have a great Christmas and New Year, and we will be back, as we said, early January, which is the week of the seventh. And anything else before we go? Um, just uh, go Celtics. Ah, there we go. All right, and we will talk to you not next week, but next year. See you in the new year.